This is childrensbookradio.com. Welcome back to Children's Book Radio, the podcast about children's books. This is show number 49 for May 30th, 2011. My name is Jody Weisler, and I am the host for this podcast. I am an avid reader for all types of books, a university instructor, and a writer for various parenting websites, but most importantly, the parent of twins named Madison and Logan, who are soon to be six years old. They are reading, and they read to us each and every day, and of course, we also read to them. I would like to welcome you to childrensbookradio.com if you are a new listener. Our subscriber base continues to grow thanks to you. If you have any comments, book recommendations, or just want to say hi, please send an email or mp3 to sabrina at teachtopia.com. I encourage you to go right now to childrensbookradio.com and there you can check out our previous shows as well as check out our grade level reading list. If you want to advertise, please go to sales at teachtopia.com. That is sales at teachtopia.com and mention Children's Book Radio. As always, a special thanks to Mark Leonard who provided our intro music. Now on to the interview and topic for today's show. It's a good one today. Today's focus is on children's book author and poet Robert Forbes. He has written Let's Have a Bite, a banquet of beastly rhymes. Just published in 2010, the writing by Robert Forbes combined with drawing of Donald Searle, I should say drawings of Donald Searle, make this book a must read. This book by Robert Forbes is his second book of poetry and hopefully in our upcoming interview, we'll find out more about his future writing. Let me tell you a little bit about Let's Have a Bite, a banquet of beastly rhymes, before we start the interview. Let's Have a Bite, a banquet of beastly rhymes is a collection of 30 plus poems written for children. They consistently involve animals and sometimes involve animals interactions with people. From the jungle to the ocean, Robert Forbes takes children around the world in his very child-friendly poems. My own children found them silly and fun, and while they did not understand everything Mr. Forbes put into each poem, they thoroughly enjoyed the settings, the enthralling characters, and the frequent use of rhyme. They also liked the accompanying pictures. I could clearly see making his books a keeper and having my children reread his poetry as they continue their elementary years. We are lucky to have Mr. Forbes with us and probably the best introduction to Mr. Forbes and his poetry is to ask him to read from his book, Let's Have a Bite, A Banquet of Beastly Rhymes. Mr. Forbes, could you please read one of your poems for us? Okay, I will be happy to do a reading from my second book called Let's Have a Bite, A Banquet of Beastly Rhymes. This is the first poem in the book. It's called The Chocolate Bunny. The chocolate bunny ate a lemon drop, thinking it would help his hop. It gave him bounce, but his next litter of chocolate bunnies tasted bitter. He left the oldie candy shop, convinced the drops made him a flop. A better bunny then was bought by a customer who thought, This is quite a tangy treat, dark and edgy, not too sweet. Business at the candy shop started then to boom non-stop. Sweet is neat, but bitter's neater for the savvy chocolate eater. Our bunny then bounced back to work with a new digestive quirk. He and his milk chocolate missus now only smooch with lemon drop kisses. Great poem and great reading. Now let's continue our questions. First of all, we truly enjoyed reading both of your poetry books, although today we are focused a little bit more on Let's Have a Bite, A Banquet of Beastly Rhymes. In your second book, My Children Found the Zoo VIP as the funniest thing ever. What launched you from the publishing world to the world of writing silly, humorous, and creative poems for children? Well, I'm delighted you like my the zoo VIP, very idle panda. Uh, that actually was based on a um, trip to the zoo that I took with my wife. 
I love to go to the zoo and see what the animals are doing. They give me lots of inspiration. And there was in Milwaukee a panda pavilion, a big thing, and I uh, had to pay a little bit extra to go see the panda. I thought, this is exciting. Let's go see what it's all about. Well, I went in and saw the panda, and my poem was pretty much my reaction. On the way back uh, to the hotel, I composed this in my head having been somewhat disappointed by what I'd found there. Um, you ask about what, how I made the transition, so to speak, from publishing world to the world of writing silly, humorous things. Um, it's actually not such a strange stretch in that the world of business, uh, which I'm in, um, we do a lot of writing, try to be a little bit creative with it, sending emails, letters, proposals, that sort of thing. You put a little bit of yourself in it. You're careful about the language you use, the words you pick, trying to give it some, infuse it with some of your own personality. So um, making that transition then into writing poetry, uh, well, I started jotting things down, listening to things. I didn't sit down one day and say, hey, I'm going to write a children's book. Uh, it, one thing came, then another thing, and I started writing them down as I still do, and uh, turned them into poems, and then I had enough of them, and my wife thought they were amusing, and then I thought, let's get an illustrator, and many years later, voila, there's a book, and then a couple of years after that, another book. Plenty more on the way. Animals are an obvious reoccurring theme throughout both your books. Why? And do you plan on sticking with the animal theme for your future writings? Indeed, animals, uh, to me, um, are a, a fine way to invoke characters that I see uh, from the animal point of view, to create characters who do these silly things as, as animals, and but that also have some human characteristics, the way they reflect some things about people. I find animals are very good ways to do it. I try not to make them totally anthropomorphic in that... I don't want to turn them entirely into people, but I uh, have some fun with them while keeping their animal characteristics. The uh, theme has sure worked. Um, there are lots of different animals lend themselves to different things. And um, I'm, as I say, we've got plenty more books in the works. Literary devices, specifically the personification of animals and some rich vocabulary is ever present in your writing. When you write, do you think about the teacher or parent examining your language and style, or do you simply just write? That's a fair question. I basically just write. It's what occurs to me, uh, in, inspired, at, as I say, by a visit to the zoo or listening to the radio where you pick something up, um, conversations with friends, observing the world around me. Um, finding the right words. I don't always know, let's say, where a poem is going to end when I start it, and sometimes I know where I want it to end, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. I try to use words that fit, that, that are colorful, that are precise, but sometimes they're a big word that um, I think a child should never be talked down to. So using big words is a challenge for them, and what greater way for, a, for them to have an interaction with a, an adult than saying, what does that mean? Or listening to the context of, the, of, the, of a phrase or a line, maybe they can help figure with their parents or grandparents, they can figure out what that word means. Um, I, as I've said, language is one of the keystones of being a, a writer, and uh, certainly for poetry, is finding the right words. The other, probably even bigger part of it is imagination. As I tell uh, young people when I go to read at schools or do libraries and whatnot, is that they all have imaginations as good as mine, as good as anybody else's. It's what you do with it. So word choice and imagination are, the, as I say, the cornerstones, of, for me, of writing. Maybe we read the house guest, one of your poems, too deeply. But I think you are saying a lot in this poem. A guest with excessive TV consumption, 
a need for employment, and an ultimate effect on the host. Could you tell us a little bit about the house guest and what led you to write it? Well, the house guest, um, not exactly based on a true incident, but certainly from friends who've had house guests come to visit, uh, not always thrilled with uh, the fact that, that, like a fish, it is fine for a couple of days, but then begins to go bad. It's time to get rid of it. Um, I thought, well, now how do we translate this into an animal? And I thought about the the old cliche of the octopus being in a house with eight arms doing all these different tasks. What would happen if if we combined that and had an octopus who was a house guest who did nothing, just sat there and watched TV? Um, and when time told it was time to go, he said, oh, yes, this has been great. I've actually enjoyed it and have recovered. Thank you very much. And gave everybody a present. And, of course, the present he left me was a taste for all the soap operas that he'd been watching on TV. Um, I, I know how addictive soap operas can be. So I thought this would be a, an amusing way to tie it all together. The illustrator Donald Searle did a fantastic job. So did he just take your words and go with it? Any insight into your collaboration? Um, yes, he d indeed does an extraordinary job um, with the pictures. I don't know if you are aware, but one of the things that Ronald, Ronald and I worked very hard on was to put a mouse in each illustration. So as you look through the book, be sure to see if you can find the mouse sometimes easy to find sometimes a little difficult but that makes being with the book fun for the younger kids who don't necessarily know what the poem is about or um, they like the rhymes and the words and the or the um, the meters the rhythm of a, of a poem but may not understand what it's about finding the mouse is fun what i do is i'll give ronald um, a couple of poems at a time and maybe a few lines of my thoughts about the poem and then it's over to him and uh, let his imagination take over the illustrations I get back I mean I'm like a little boy at Christmas time opening up the package and suddenly there's these characters that I had created have come to life magnificently the colors the attention to detail the funny ways he's interpreted their actions um, it's, it's such joy he, he'd done some work for us in our lifestyle magazine that um, I thought was spectacular um, he of course done work in life magazine and look magazine so I knew his work growing up and um, when I thought about getting an illustrator to do the poems I said to myself, who is the best in the world? Who's the best guy I could possibly think of? And it was Ronald Searle. I thought, ah, oh, he's such a famous guy, he'll never do it. So, as I tell people when I'm doing a reading, you don't know until you try. You have to make, go for the best and see what happens. All he can do is tell me no, and uh, you can imagine my thrill when he said yes, that he would do it. And we've been doing this for a number of years now and um, are working on a number of other projects. So uh, I, I feel blessed to have him as my illustrator. It's quite a, quite a, quite a thrill and a, and a pleasure. And, I, boy, when people sit down and look at these pictures, uh, they, they corroborate the choice. He's spectacular. Finally, we want to thank you for spending your time with us. Is there any thoughts that you would like to share with the many parents, teachers, librarians, and even young readers who listen to Children's Book Radio. Yes. Um, well, my final thoughts would be to write down your thoughts. Always have a pen, pencil, iPad, computer with you. When something occurs to you that that, that amuses you as a as a as a as a as a writer in particular, or as a teacher and a parent, that you think should be imparted to a, a, a somebody else, either a young person or whatnot, write it down because if you don't, it goes away. The thoughts we have we think are brilliant, well, they do tend to get consumed by other things and if we don't write them down, we may, we may lose them. 
the other thought is that uh, even though the world of books is changing, things are going electronic in many ways, um, I think printed books will be around for a while longer. Um, but don't be afraid of the new technology. Embrace it and um, see what you can do, how you find your own level of comfort in it. Sometimes you have to push yourself to take a look at Facebook, say, or pick up this new uh, a new tablet and see what it's all about. Um, it can be quite freeing and find out what's going on in the world. Um, anyway, it's the idea that imparting joy th through reading, read books, is the final thought I would leave you with because books are the key to the world. Um, thank you very much. I've had a lot of fun thinking about these very good questions and um, hope we'll get together again soon. Bye. Thank you, Robert Forbes, for being with us at childrensbookradio.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of childrensbookradio.com and encourage you to go to our site and listen to our past episodes and enjoy the many resources available. See you at childrensbookradio.com and until our next episode, Goodbye.